This week, Paul and I talk open source software. In the news, Apple has a nasty kernel heap overflow bug in High Sierra 10.13.3. A new macOS backdoor has been discovered with ties to APT32. And a brand new Michigan law makes possession of ransomware illegal. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. Today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced back doors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash ASW. Active Countermeasures, make every analyst a hunter. IT Pro TV, binge worthy learning for IT teams. Why is it binge worthy? It's learning presented in an engaging and entertaining talk show format that beats voiceover PowerPoint snooze fests. Watch over 3,300 hours of content in their on demand library on your desktop, on the go, or in the comfort of your own living room. IT Pro TV is IT training you and your team actually want to watch, which means a better return on your learning investment. Get started with IT Pro TV for teams by visiting itpro.tv forward slash security weekly and start a seven-day free trial and get 30% off standard or premium IT Pro TV memberships using the code SECWEEKLY30. Welcome, everyone, to episode 12, our 13th episode of Application Security Weekly. I am, of course, your host, Keith Hudlett, and I'm excited to be joined by my illustrious co-host, Paul Asadorian. I'm feeling very illustrious today because it's warm out and I can wear like a regular hat, not a winter hat, and a t-shirt. And therefore, I am illustrious. <laughs> What's going yeah, on, Keith? You are, you are classy, Paul. You are extremely classy. Classy yeah, and illustrious. Nice red hat. So, no, it's, uh, it's going to be good. I mean, it's still cold up here in New Hampshire, which is kind of sad. Uh, but, hey, I'm going to San Francisco for RSA tomorrow. So it'll be hopefully a little bit warmer there. And, you know, I'll be able to wear a T-shirt and shorts just like the rest of the world. So, uh, Sweet. But, yeah, a couple of announcements here. Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. Go ahead. All right, so just a couple of announcements for this segment. Uh, first and foremost, go to itpro.tv slash securityweekly and use the code secweekly30 to try a free seven-day trial and receive a 30% off of your monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. Uh, I've personally really enjoyed a lot of their content. I mean, quite frankly, they're continually adding to it. And uh, unlike, I think, some of the other you know learning uh, e-learning tools out there, they, they make it interactive, kind of like this podcast, especially for those that watch out on YouTube. So. Uh, I really enjoy their content, and I think that you know you should check it out. Uh, the other thing to check out as well is uh, Source Boston is coming up on May nineteenth and t- or excuse me, May ninth and tenth. You go to sourceconference.com and register using the code SW seventy five WMKW. That's Security Weekly seventy five Whiskey Mike Kilo Whiskey. You get a seventy five dollar discount. Uh, Paul will be there speaking, I believe, if uh, I'm not mistaken. Paul, is that correct? Yes, I will be at Source Boston talking about Docker security. Uh, which will be fun, and we'll be doing uh, some trivia uh, interviews at Source Boston at our booth, so make sure you stop by. Yeah, it'll be good. Are, are we going to have bourbon again, or is it whiskey? or what, what uh, really Likely, yeah. likely not. Just throwing that out there. Just because... Okay, we'll, we'll have delicious water. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Apparently, in all the hotels that we have ever visited in the world, this particular one where Source uh, Boston is being held is really, really, really strict about bringing in booze. So, uh, Yeah, they probably have some sort of license or agreements with the local distributors that they just can't, you know, can't get away most with. Most hotels so, do, eh. and most hotels will be like, whatever. It, it, long, I mean, if you know what I mean? Like, if you got one bottle and you're kind of discreet about it like they don't care this hotel apparently does so we will Ah. not (laughs) unless we go to the bar in the hotel which i'm all for if there's a bar in the hotel i'm sure there is we can go there and and, and have drinks how about that that would actually be a really good time are you coming are you coming to source boston 
I am planning to be there. Uh, okay. So I am actually working with uh, some of my colleagues at Bug Crowd to see if we can have a presence at the conference as well. Uh, so we're currently talking with Rob Shane a little bit about that uh, on the side. But in the meantime, I'm planning to go. I mean, I think it's going to be a great conference with a lot of really great speakers. Uh, Masha Sadova was on Paul Security Weekly, what, last week, was it? Two weeks ago at this two point? Two weeks ago. That was two uh, weeks ago. Yeah, last night, was, last night was Ron Gula. Uh, week oh, before yeah. that was, was Masha, who's the Thursday morning keynote, correct? Yeah, so uh, she has been on there as well uh, in terms of Security Weekly. Go check out the main show for that. And uh, yeah, to that end, uh, this week we're going to talk a little bit about open source. So uh, one of the things that came up this week is it's GitHub's 10-year anniversary. And just kind of going through some of the the context about you know where GitHub has come from, it, it's crazy to see the community, how it, it's grown. I mean, Metasploit was and still is an open, uh, open source project. And a number of other uh, profitable companies and organizations have uh, gone the open source route. So, uh, Paul, kick it off to you. 2008 is the the first start of GitHub, but before that, uh, 2005 is when the the actual protocol was written by none other than the infamous Linus Torvalds uh, of Linux. So, interesting to see GitHub uh, kind of its its rise and its growth. Uh, what are some of your initial thoughts looking at kind of the timeline here that we have linked under the wiki? Yeah, so uh, I was just trying to go back. I don't even know if they make the software uh, anymore. When my first version control system that I ever used was in like 1999 uh, or earlier, and it was called PVS. I don't know if you ever, if you're, oh, you're probably not old enough to remember PVS. Uh, it ran on like OS2 warp and stuff, uh, which is awesome. Ooh. And I went to training for, uh, for that in Boston, ironically enough. Uh, to get trained up and do a, a software migration uh, from one of our version control system platforms to the same one, just a, a newer version. And so that was my kind of introduction into um, version control systems, branch development, merging, and all that stuff. And then as I went through, there was, of course, SVN was the popular one that everyone was using for version control. And that was cool. And then like one day I looked around and I'm like, wait, why isn't anyone using SVN anymore? And everyone's like, oh, well, I'll using <laughs> Git now. And I'm like, okay, now I got to get on the Git bandwagon. And I had to learn Git. Uh, and I've been using Git pretty much ever since uh, for any type of version control uh, that we do. So, or that I do, even my own stuff, right? Just backing up scripts or config files gets, gets the, the platform. So, interesting really progression. And to, the extent, to the extent that, I mean, I, I've worked at companies that have used Subversion and still do use Subversion in some cases. And, and in my mind, it's kind of like a, a situation of why. Almost everyone that I know has adopted Git in terms of uh, kind of their workflows, whether it's GitHub or GitLab or some of the other um, you know, providers of source code repositories that are third-party providers. Yeah, uh, I mean, but, why, why wouldn't you want to store all of your source code with the, in the cloud? I mean, it's just, it's, it's good, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's just the thing though paul is like a lot of uh companies so bug crowd uh is a, a github um you know customer as well so uh, to that end there are personally i have my own uh kind of paid account as well and i i have private repositories that i leverage as part of that and i think that what a, a lot of people have kind of realized is similar to the idea of the cloud where people are you know purchasing it because they have the five nines uptime um, the same sort of reasons why you want to run, uh, you know, a source code repository in the cloud is in this case, maybe with GitHub or GitLab is because of the fact that they're probably doing more to secure that platform than you are. And to the extent that unless you are Google or Amazon or Microsoft, who very well may use GitHub themselves, I don't know, but it, unless you're one of those companies, let's face it. Uh, your source code is probably of less value than a lot of other companies that are using it today, right? Well, it could be of less value, but it could be a very similar or catastrophic impact on the software company. So I think from a risk perspective, yeah. you know, if even if you're a small company, you've got internal software or you're just starting to sell some of your software and then that software source code gets leaked out, that could be a bad day revenue-wise for your company and potentially cause you to go out of business. Um, but what some one of the trends, uh, you know, Rangul was here in studio yesterday recording a lot of segments and we were talking about the migration to the cloud. And 
I, I kind of I'm starting to uh, agree with Ron's assessment and others' assessments that the large companies that you mentioned, Keith, and even large financial companies, I think we're seeing the really large companies um, that they're like, yeah, that cloud thing is really cute. Like what we can build is our own cloud with the same or better uptime than what these other services provide. And oh, by the way, we're going to do it more securely because we're going to keep it in house and limit some of our exposure. And a lot of those teams certainly can build more reliable and more secure infrastructure because of just the sheer size of their organization. Now, once you step out of like, okay, we don't have 100,000 employees and you know, I don't know how many thousand dedicated to our IT staff uh, and internal engineering to pull that off. Once you peel that back, you're probably not in a position, like Keith said, to provide better uptime and security than what GitHub is providing. We're a small, you know, small operation, uh, you know, probably just shy of 10 people. So uh, that makes a whole lot of sense for us because we don't have the infrastructure. I think newer startups too may start to rely on more and more of these services, especially when they're small, to get things going. So they don't have to worry about the IT operations management uh, of all these systems internally. You can just use the ones in the cloud. And I, and I think until you're at that really large organization, um, you know, you're going to do these things yourself, especially if it's open source, you're talking about open source, you can take that and use that internally, you're not selling it. So you can use it internally, you know, no harm, no foul. And we actually have a, an article in the news segment that we're going to talk about that uh, specifically related to JavaScript and open source and kind of concerns around security. But um, what I found interesting as, as well, though, Paul, is there are a number of uh, organizations or entities that have actually moved open source for their software offering uh, and still become profitable organizations today. So, for example, sure. uh, Rails yeah. uh, started back in 2008. On April 3rd, 2008, they moved to GitHub. Bitcoin was invented in uh, January 3rd, 2009 and is uh, somewhat largely or strongly developed on, on GitHub as well. Um, and then, of <clears> course, <throat> Node.js that same year. Uh, to think that Node.js, by the way, is nine years old is a little crazy, just kind of, kind of as an aside, right? We were just talking about JavaScript last week. Mm. And, uh, and to think that, you know, this thing is just nine years old uh, is a little weird to me. Um, but examples of companies that have actually become profitable as a result of open sourcing or, or allowing for the open sourcing of their code is, uh, so Travis Continuous Integration or Travis CI, Docker. Uh, so Docker is open source as of 2014 on uh, June 9th of that year. Uh, and then also we, ha we have uh, companies like Microsoft on uh, 23rd October of 2014 uh, ended up open sourcing .NET, right? Like, so there are uh, major organizations that are starting to open source their code base uh, that are still very profitable and, and to the extent that they're, you know, reaping the benefits of crowdsourced or crowd developed software might not be such a bad thing in the long run from a security standpoint anyway. It's true. I, and, you know, I, we can uh, talk about this so many in almost every episode and really have kind of a, a a different take on it and it's one of the more difficult things you can have open source and you can monetize on it you can have something free and still monetize and how you do that wow is there a lot of different models right like uh does there's a subscription model there's the open source model there's the free model how do you limit that I don't know. In the context of software, I, I think in, in application development, application security, that's really interesting uh, from a lot of different perspectives. Security-wise, it's it's kind of easy to have the open source because it's just open, and if it's the intention is to be free and out there, you know, to the world. When you start moving into free trials or limiting software in a certain way, all that stuff can be circumvented, and people will. I'm telling you right now. I've worked for a lot of software companies. People will. Uh, cheat the system if they can, especially if we're hackers, you know, uh, that's, that's just the way the nature of the beast, right? We're, we're going to push things to their limits. Um, so, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons, I do like the open source, like Microsoft open sourcing .net. I, I don't think selling .net was a huge part of their business, though. I think that their business model right. today is anyone can use .net, it's open source, have at it. By the way, if you want a nice place to host that, come to Azure and, and pay us money. And that's their business model now. Right, right. Which I think is smart. 
It, which is exactly the, it's kind of the idea that, uh, that Apple adopted way back when with their computers, right? So they got their computers into elementary, middle, and high schools, and in some cases, colleges. Mm-hmm. And, you know, well, yeah, what did people still, want to start developing on after they graduated? Yeah, because you still got to license a Windows computer to run .NET. I mean, I guess you could run it not on Windows. I've heard of people the trying to do machine, that. Yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, I don't think. But... Uh, and then you're like, well, if I need to run it in the cloud, I can just go to Azure and then I buy some Azure space and I can run my .NET application. So, um, and I'm sure I, and I haven't uh, kept up with it. Does, is Microsoft going down the serverless route? So basically like I can just take yeah, .NET application. I'm sure they are, right? I can just take my .NET applications and run them, uh, in, in Microsoft serverless in, environment in Azure. So. Yeah, that's in fact, one of the things that it's interesting because, um, uh, obviously in AWS, they call it Lambda. Uh, but in Azure, they don't seem to have like a special name for it other than it's just, you know, running serverless on Azure. So, yeah, right. they are they are absolutely going down the path of, of serverless as well. In fact, uh, there is a number of trainings that have just recently been released by John Papa, uh, who is a, I think, development relations uh, expert at Microsoft for Azure, uh, who is talking specifically about like Node.js and AngularJS development uh, in uh, Azure, as well as serverless development uh, using JavaScript and Node in Azure as well. Um, so it's it's interesting to see kind of that adoption from from the other side of it, which is, again, something that we kind of talked about last night, Paul, on Paul Security Weekly, which was uh, the idea of companies, you know, trying to push people to the cloud. And I think that the adoption of, or at least the this, the use of open source code or open source libraries is making people a little bit more comfortable with that idea. And then to that end as well, of course, uh, what ends up happening is then you have to go and start using the services that those companies provide, Mm -hmm. uh, which is like, uh, you know, it's it's getting a beachhead. It ultimately is what they're trying to do here. Uh, Didn't uh, Apple also open source Swift, if I'm not mistaken, as well, which is the language that is used for writing iOS and other apps? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Pretty sure they did. It's not here on GitHub, I don't think. I think they did open source it. Um, so that is one of those things that it's, it's kind of the next big model, right? So like, uh, Kubernetes, uh, another example of an open source tool that is, uh, largely supported by Google. Uh, and so it's, it's interesting to see these projects that have come about as open source that are supported by large organizations as well, that are not necessarily directly owned by them. I just, um, you know, well, you've actually been doing, I, Go ahead. I, and I think we're about to talk about the same thing. And I'm um, kind of at a crossroads with our internal application that we're developing here is like, how all in do I go into Amazon's cloud? Maybe we just, we crowdsource this, this decision, right? So Amazon announced right. Fargate. Did I say that right? It sounds like a science fiction that? movie. I think it's Fargate. <laughs> Isn't that a show? <laughs> it is. I think it is a show, right? Yeah. But no, it's also... Farscape. And Fargate, your Fargate. Fargate. Yeah. Did I say that initially? Fargate. Yeah. Yes, you did. Farscape is the show that you're thinking. Of. Ah, okay. Uh, so Fargate is a, a an Amazon product. It runs containers without managing servers or clusters. You basically, uh, so for Amazon ECS and EKS, I'm assuming that's Elastic Container Service and Elastic Kubernetes Service. Or sounds uh, about right. And also, you got to use their uh, registry. Amazon has their own registry service, right? Or no? Is that yep. is that ECS yes. is their ECS. own is built into ECS? It's not a different acronym, right? Okay. So that's my it, understanding. So Fargate allows you to run containers without having to manage servers or clusters. You no longer have to provision, configure, and scale clusters of virtual machines to run containers. So basically so I'm not sure how Fargate is like more services for your that's running container. I, I mean you could do this with ECS and EKS. Fargate, I guess, runs. Matt was Alderman was explaining it last week. Underneath or on top, it's I forget. Like serverless containers. It's, it is it's serverless like, containers. Yes. So basically, I mean, I can tell Amazon ECS to run my containers today, but this makes it easier. It orchestrates them for you and runs them and has your registry, and it just makes it easy to do that. And I guess I still have, I still have my containers, right? Uh, my containers aren't right necessarily specific to Amazon. So if I wanted to pick up my toys and go home or go to Docker Hub or, or you know, Docker's uh, ecosystem or Azure or OpenShift, well, I guess that might be an issue, but uh, there's some portability if I'm, if I'm controlling my own Docker containers, right? So I guess that helps the decision. And being totally all in an Amazon, 
I don't know. Is it a good decision if you're a small software operation? I think so. If you're a, a larger uh, firm that's looking for investments and you're, you're making enterprise uh, software for enterprises, you may want to have an on-premise solution. And then how does that, you know, how does that play in so that you don't want to be too tied um, to it? But anyway, I think it's an interesting decision. It, and it's almost like this is their, um, their competitor to Kubernetes, for the lack of a better term, right? Like it's, it's a way for you to automatically orchestrate all of your containers in, in the cloud without having to worry about provisioning servers and all those other clusters and stuff like that. So um, to that end, it's, it's an interesting uh, announcement. Did, you, did this recently come out? I actually didn't catch this when it, it did. Out. Matt Alderman, were you out last week? Did Alderman do Application Security Weekly or Business Security Weekly? with me last business security weekly was business Matt Alderman and I, yeah. and he was at an Amazon, uh, AWS one day forum that they're, they're doing all across the world and said the yep. line to get into the Fargate, um, talks at this one day conference was like out the door. Like everyone was just like, so hot to trot, uh, to learn about this new technology. So, uh, I wonder if when they came up with the name that they, uh, smashed Stargate, and Farscape, right? It sounds, shows it's very sci-fi. Yeah, very sci-fi. Like, um, I, I don't know. I think uh, you know the software that we develop internally. My goal is to eventually sell it to help uh, other people manage, you know, their uh, media and, and, and podcasts and, and things like that. So, I guess why a question for you and our audience, right? Why wouldn't you deploy into AWS Fargate, monetizing the Amazon marketplace, uh, and just build out your software that way. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point. Is you know suddenly uh, platform platformize. I don't even know if that's a word. Uh, but you know, t take your software that you have built, uh, turn it into a, a managed sort of platform that you can then sell that software to others uh, through something like the you know the store that they allow or they they offer uh, up here. You know, maybe you know it's a, I mean, I, it's it, a it, reasonable business model. Right, I, I think it would, and I'm not sure what the marketplace integration is, but if a user could go to the marketplace and go, okay, I want a new, you know, piece of software that I want to use in the cloud, you know, add, add to cart, buy it, and then in the background, Fargate will orchestrate all the containers, do all the setup and all that stuff, and build an environment for, uh, for that customer. I, I think that's, I think that's pretty awesome. I don't know. I, I guess Docker has some competing, a competing service now too, right? Yeah, I think it's Docker Docker Enterprise Edition is what mm -hmm. they're offering, uh, as well as they have like Docker Swarm and, and all that other stuff that they do for kind of orchestration of containers as well. Well, um, they also get, have getting, a store uh, that where you can buy, you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, so, but yeah, you're. I think you're stuck. I don't think you can use Kubernetes uh, as the orchestrator on Docker's platform, I think. Although I've been told oh, yeah. Kubernetes well, actually, has won, right? I, I, Swarm's going away is what I heard. So I think Kubernetes is actually now available uh, to be or as the orchestrator for Docker yeah. on Docker's uh, okay. offering. I actually saw something I think last night on just that yeah. they've updated their website. I, I saw something about Kubernetes and Docker, which was uh, you know it's uh, match made in heaven. Who knows? Maybe swarms um, going away. But it's my prediction. Yeah, right. It's well, going to so go away completely. It'll be it'll be interesting to see if that happens. But then again, uh, Google's putting a lot of uh, a lot of weight and resources behind Kubernetes. So if, if, a, if a major organization is willing to do that and it mm -hmm. does, the, it solves the same problem, you might as well let them, right? Like just augment and supplement your own offering with what they can already provide you anyway. Uh, let them spend the money on it. But uh, uh, Keith, Keith, this so is, I mean, this is still pretty ble bleeding edge, right? I mean, there's, I mean, there are companies very. doing it, but I think most organizations aren't deploying software, uh, you know, in this way. So it's like, how bleeding edge do you want to be? Right. Well, so as we were talking about, I think just before the show is uh, Docker itself is 2014 is version 1.0, yeah. right? So uh, four years, and that was June 9th. So not even four years, you know, three years and, and months uh, since that even became a main technology. And now it seems to be all that everybody talks about in the security space. And it's so young. Uh, and Kubernetes is even younger than that. It's probably less than two years old at this point. Right. Um, so to that end, I guess uh, maybe to, to wrap up specifically on open source before I talk a little bit about the learning and tools that I have uh, lined up for this week. Um, I think it's generally a good thing, uh, especially if you can leverage open source libraries for doing uh, certain secure uh, practices such as password validation or things of that nature. Uh, worth, worth having because it's going to get more uh, scrutiny and, and therefore also 
everyone benefits from having strong password management and, and things of that nature. Uh, but to your point as well, Paul, if you're going to go uh, open source or you're to a cloud provider, think about how you're securing it because uh, GitHub does a good job with two-factor authentication, but uh, you got to be careful, especially because it's easy to make things public that shouldn't be public. Yeah, that happened to us. Oops. Yeah, yeah, I've I've actually had people, you know, invite me by accident to their private repositories and then quickly remove me. Yeah, uh, oh, that well. didn't so happen. That, that, that didn't happen with us on GitHub, but it have or, or Git, but it happened with us on on AWS. Because it's easy to just yeah, like spin things up, and then it's like, oh, yeah. Did I mention we should create firewall rules for that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. More on that. More uh, on that so later. Actually, we we actually are working with uh, Layered Insight um, to look at their product. Uh, they're a sponsor of the show, and also uh, get some help analyzing a security incident that we had, um, which is pretty awesome. So I'm excited. That that'll be interesting to hear, especially if we can get them on the show to talk more about it. Yeah, that's uh, the plan. Yeah, be... That's the plan for sure. That's yeah, and in the so a couple uh, of loading. And... Go ahead, because we get to yeah. end this segment no, 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 to go please. on to the next one. Well, I was just going to say the uh, the person from Layered Insight has a lot of experience deploying in Docker. Like, a, is someone with a, a couple of years' experience with Docker is like awesome because that's like half the amount of time that it's been uh, around. <laughs> it's, yeah, after one point, oh, I right? want ten years of Docker. Experience yeah, exactly. On the <laughs> we should <laughs> we should create a fake job opening. <laughs> we want uh, eight years of Node.js experience. <laughs> I'm sure that probably pre when was Node created? It's it in that. Was, uh, gosh, going it's in that link in the article. show yeah, notes. A, yeah, 2000 and, uh, 2009. So okay, uh, you know we we want 12 years of Node experience and at least 10 years of Docker experience. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of the learning and tools I wanted to cover uh, just this week. So I'm not going to go too deeply into them. Uh, the first one is JSON Compare. So it's a, a fully featured JSON tool. Uh, that allows you to directly input and validate JSON code, upload and validate multiple batch of JSON files simultaneously, and also compare or diff and merge JSON objects. So uh, if you're working with JSON, go check that out. It's story number one under learning and tools. Uh, another interesting one on there is Snallygaster, uh, which is an open source tool for finding God secret files on HTTP you. servers. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Gazoo day. Uh, <laughs> Snallygaster. <laughs> Sorry, had to sneeze there. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, <laughs> Docker Classroom story number three. So uh, basically, if you've got to learn Docker, you might as well start doing it at this point because it's not going away. Containers exist, and Docker is more or less the standard for containerization technology. Uh, last one, we can talk about it a little bit briefly here, Paul, is uh, Rapid7 has opened up their data set from their uh, Project Heisenberg uh, data, which is their scanning of the internet. So some people uh, think Shodan uh, as... Uh, uh, Harbor Master, as I, as I know him uh, on on uh, Twitter, would say, Bob Rudis, I should say, uh, it's nowhere, nothing like uh, Shodan because they actually follow the law, unlike Shodan. Mm. Uh, so interesting. Okay. Uh, it, it's an, yeah, it's an open source data set uh, from their UDP, TCP scans, SSL certs, uh, reverse DNS, uh, HTTP and HTTPS traffic, ev basically everything that you could possibly imagine that doesn't touch, you know, like uh, black net uh, areas like, uh, you know, military space, etc. So check that out. That is uh, story number four under learning and tools. And with that, we will take a break and come back for the news.